Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, as uh, I was already introduced, I'm afraid this time uh, my talk is not going to go around the aviation or airplanes. It's going to be going around the concept of uh, memory forensics. And um, actually, in approach, I followed to try to defeat memory forensics. Okay, so let's start. Okay, this is uh, kind of the organization of the of the talk. We're going to be dividing it in uh, four phases. Although I can let you know already that one of them we will have to make it for whoever is interested after the talk, because we actually can't have or don't have all the time to to stretch all the content here. Okay, I'm going to take my glasses because I see nothing otherwise. Now I don't see you, but at least I'm not blind. Okay, so uh, let's begin with the background, the story behind uh, this research that I'm presenting here now. Okay, long story short, this uh, research began in uh, January 2016 when a friend of mine and uh, organizer of another security conference in Finland called T2 uh, threw me a challenge. Okay, he already knew that I'm quite keen on developing my own offensive security tools for purely research purposes, while he is actually quite uh, focused on the defensive part of it, so uh, forensics analysis, and especially he is quite keen on the memory forensics analysis uh, discipline. So he told me if I could uh, try to find a way to make my offensive security tools uh, prove uh, bulletproof against his uh, memory forensic uh, skills and techniques. And, um, and hence I had one year to, to try to, to defeat or win that challenge. Okay. And the result of that challenge is what we are going to be expl explaining here. But not just the, the, the results of the, of the research. I'm going to also explain a little bit the, the process on how I decided to, to approach, uh, this, uh, this research. Okay. So the first thing I had to do, uh, after accepting the challenge, because I had to accept the challenge, <laughs> that there is no, 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 no other option. Okay. Was to, to kind of uh, train myself. Okay. Because the first thing you, you gotta do is, um, is to get familiar with, um, with the field you're gonna be targeting. In this case, uh, memory forensics, right? So you have to, to know yourself. In, in this case, I was aware of my own knowledge and skills in the offensive security field, let's say. But, um, even though I was aware of the high skills of my, my friend, uh, not during this challenge, but well, still friend, uh, on uh, memory forensics, um, I was also aware of uh, my lack of expertise in that field, right? So the first thing I had to do was to increase my knowledge in memory forensics. Otherwise, it would be hard to defeat them. So first step, ask for help. Okay. So I just, um, ask for help to the, to the people I knew. I happen to, to, to know that are somehow familiar with the, with the field, uh, memory forensics. Uh, first and foremost, of course, my challenger, uh, Tommy. And, uh, the guy in the middle is, uh, the author of, uh, uh, a reverse engineering framework, but also memory forensics or forensics tool, uh, Radar 2 and many other uh, people, right? So I gather some information from them and tips and uh, recommendations. And one of them was obviously to actually uh, read this book, okay? It's like the book of memory forensics because it's really good, because it's a kind of a mandatory read and also because it's the only one. Okay, so I got this book and I started to read about the art of memory forensics. Like, welcome to the wonderful world of memory forensics. So you start to read and you say, okay, forensics 101. Okay, so starting now I'm going to call it uh, Mem6 because I like to shorten words. And it uh, looks like uh, uh, Mem6 is like the the part of the digital forensics uh, discipline that it's uh, focusing specifically on the analysis of volatile data. That has some advantages over disk forensics, over network forensics. It has some drawbacks. It's a complex discipline, complicated, a lot of theory. And then after reading and reading and reading, I realized that, okay, I had to step, to stop, okay, take a step back and realize, okay, maybe that's not the best approach. Okay, now we get more people. Welcome. So let's analyze. It's, uh, it's, the discipline is called memory forensics. Meaning that it's the, the process, the art, the discipline, the science of applying forensic technique, forensic techniques to memory. Okay, great. Something I realized while reading that book is that actually I had um, a problem on the root of my knowledge is that I actually had not such a good knowledge on memory itself, right? So before even I 
targeted uh, the, the forensics part of it, I had to increase a lot, badly, my knowledge on memory management, okay? Of course, the problem was, but which memory, okay? Windows, Linux, OS X, iOS, Android, QNX, there are so many platforms over there, and all of them have different, slightly or massively different um, management, memory management uh, architecture and processes that I had to, defi uh, to decide for one, right? So I came back to my challenger, I asked him, and he decided that I had to target Windows memory forensics. Okay. Uh, for some reason, he's one of those persons that I still believe that the important information in this world is stored in Windows machines. So I had to target Windows. Not my favorite platform, but hey, we can do that. So let's go and the, go deeper into the memory and memory management. Okay. So memory in this case, it makes, uh, it, it refers to the memory that we call RAM, RAM memory. Okay. So the volatile memory. Now, there is an issue here is that operating systems and hence memory forensics, they don't really work with RAM. They work with something different, slightly different that is called virtual memory. Okay. And virtual memory happens to be the RAM memory, the physical memory that you have on your laptops and computers and phones plus something. So I stayed like two or three weeks reading about memory, uh, virtual memory until I came up with a blessing website at uh, Microsoft that explained something very important to me that was driving me crazy is that in Windows environments, for some reason, the concept, the term virtual memory is actually a polymorphic term, meaning it has more than one meaning. It depends on the context and also on who is talking to that, right? So let's see both meanings. So one of them is that, that uh, virtual memory is a physical memory plus something called a page file. Let's go and see that. Okay. So virtual memory, okay, in the left, okay, is actually the physical memory that you have on your laptops or devices plus a page file, something stored on the hard drive. Okay. Uh, Tommy here says that it brings uh, back memories because actually this is a concept that uh, it had to be implemented on the days in which the computers that uh, needed more RAM memory that actually they could have because it was expensive, right? So they had to come up with an idea to extend the physical memory, okay, that the operating system had available by adding something more. So they decided to extend it virtually with uh, some additional memory uh, stored on the hard drive, okay? So to make it a little bit more simple and understandable for you, okay, virtual memory is the equivalent of physical memory, but combining RAM plus some uh, memory stored on the hard drive. Easy, easy so far. Now, this memory, okay, it's, uh, it's divided in units. The, the units in the virtual memory are called pages, while in the physical memory they are called frames. The only purpose for that is not to confuse us, although they manage to do that, it's just to differentiate, okay, when we are talking about memory in the virtual memory or in the physical memory, okay? And there is one rule that every single page in the virtual memory has one equivalent in the physical memory, where it's actually stored. But as you can see from the arrows here, hopefully you can see, the equivalent is not one to one. So page one doesn't really need to be stored on frame one, okay? Because as long as you use the computer, memory gets used and freed and used and freed, it gets mixed and maxed. And there is something called memory management unit that it's a tiny component on your computer that actually takes care of translating or finding one in another. So if the operating system needs to find where the page three is located, it's gonna ask the MMU and it's gonna say it's stored on frame two that happens to be on the hard drive or could be on the RAM. And it's gonna actually be changing constantly, right? Now, if it's gonna make it easier for you, and it certainly does for me, you can consider page and frames just like any other unit of memory, like bytes, bits, megabytes, these kind of things, right? It's just a random unit, so you can say how many memory is uh, being used on uh, for a certain process. Okay. Now, and that's what gets a little bit more complicated. Virtual memory, it's also known or understood as the collection of pages, that we already know what is that, okay, scattering memory of a process working set. Wow, that's like a lot of information, no worries, we're gonna see that now. Okay, let's explain the other concept. Okay, back to the same diagram, okay, we have this memory with uh, pages assigned to frames and the MMU making translations. Cool. Now, what do we ha know is that in any running system, we have processes. 
aka the applications we are running. Okay, like for example, uh, PowerPoint in my laptop right now. Okay, and this process is loaded in memory. It's using memory. Okay, and it's using memory in virtual memory, so it has assigned some amount of uh, pages that is going to be growing or uh, reducing over time. Okay. So, for whatever process, okay, the collection of pages, the amount of pages assigned to that process in virtual memory, it's called the address space or virtual memory for that process. Okay, now we have both definitions. Obviously, all these pages in virtual memory have their own um, frames in physical memory, and to the collection of those, uh, we call it the working set. Okay, I know lots of terms. It's just to give you some background idea of how memory works because actually we're going to be working with memory the entire presentation, right? So it's kind of necessary. Now, for those of you that have done some exploitation or um, offensive security memory and all these kind of things, memory corruption bugs, it may be easier for you to understand that if I tell you that this address space virtual memory for whatever process, you already have seen that many times just Okay, the way you, we see that on the left now. Okay, so that is the virtual address space, virtual memory of a process in memory. So to make it even more simple, tada. Okay, the virtual address space of a project, of uh, any process that you most probably are familiar with. Okay, it's just that in virtual memory. Whenever you run the program, okay, and it has some, uh, it has to be stored somewhere, right? There is no magic going on the computers, and that's in the physical memory in these frames. It can be in RAM or in hard drive, okay? Now, obviously, to keep making things more interesting here, uh, computers would be useless if only one process would be able to be running at a time, right? So eventually, all these devices were able to actually run more than one process. Obviously, each of those processes would have its own virtual address space or virtual memory that would have its equivalent on the physical memory, RAM or hard drive, okay? Plus, Okay, there is this differentiation in memory in uh, modern operating systems between user space and kernel space. There are more, but let's keep it simple, right? So, on top of the uh, virtual memory that we already explained, every single process has a tiny amount of memory reserved in the kernel space, okay? Always, on top of the whole kernel space that um, is loaded in memory, okay? So that's going to be our playground here, and that's where the explanation on memory management on Windows is going to end up. I wanted to keep it simple and not lose uh, the, the audience in the first five minutes, 13 minutes actually. Okay, now, some of you may be wondering, but I know a little bit about forensics, and I know that if I'm going to be studying this memory, what I'm going to be looking is for these artifacts, that is the files, open the registry, create it and read, and the network activity, and so on, so on. So where is that? Because we are just looking at memory, right? Okay. The answer is that all that stuff is where it has to be. Okay, it's on the hard drive. Okay. Now, meaning the limitation of memory forensics is that for any specific process, you are only going to be able to analyze, okay, those resources that were being induced by that process in the moment where you capture that memory. Because at that moment, that's going to be loaded into memory. Remember, memory forensics, okay, no disk forensics. So, if we take a snapshot of the computer uh, memory right now, you're going to be able to find the virtual address space of PowerPoint plus this file. And if at that moment PowerPoint is trying to check for updates with Microsoft, you're going to see that network activity also, and so on. But you will not be able to see all the PowerPoints I have on my hard drive, because I'm not opening all of them, right? Okay. So far, that's the part uh, about memory. Management on Windows. Now I'm going to go a little bit for the forensics. So I created like gazillion different versions of the slides trying to explain forensics, okay? And I realized none of them actually work, because it's a huge, massive field. Okay, with many, many different types of uh, techniques and concepts and tools. And um, it was impossible to, to put that in a single slide deck. Okay, so let me try to give you an example. And then we can see after the talk a little bit more hands-on approach on how to actually perform memory forensics. We'll see that later, okay? So let's say that when you receive, as a memory forensics analyst, uh, the memory dump of a, of a machine, okay? It's like one of those, I don't know if you can see that, on the on the bottom left, okay? It's one of those games where you start the game and you just see a black screen and a tiny 
light area where your character is, and they call the rest the folk world, okay? And you have to move around to, to kind of discover the map. Okay, uh, if you have to play games, that's quite common, okay? Now, one thing you know when you play these games, and now you know when you do memory analysis, is that uh, whenever you start moving around, okay, you're going to find known elements. You know you're going to find trees, rocks, flowers, rivers, uh, walkways, all these kind of things, right? So, the art of memory forensics is actually just the amount of, uh, the, the, the group of tools and techniques that is going to allow you to properly place all that, okay, and get a full picture of that specific memory, okay? I know it's far from technical, but, uh, well, it's already 15 minutes and we just started with the training part of the talk, right? We're here to talk about defeating memory forensics and we just start to looking at that. Okay. So, uh, that's going to be it for the theory of the, of the talk. Okay. Obviously, being that a challenge, okay, at some point the challenge had to occur. Okay. That was, remember, a challenge that was thrown to me by this guy. Okay. So, on that first uh, presentation I made of this research, at this point, okay, um, well, the challenge had to be placed. So, what were the rules and the conditions for the challenge? Okay. There were two representatives on the stage. Okay. One would be the Spanish team. That would be me. That would be the offensive guy. And on the other side, we'll have the, the Finnish team that's from Finland. That would be Tommy that you saw over there. Okay. Now, the goal for the Spanish team would be to avoid the detection of my implant, okay, by the Finnish team. While the Finnish team, our goal would be to detect my implant in a memory dump using memory forensic techniques. Now, the target. The target had to be also agreed, right? Okay, we agreed that the target would be a Windows 10, okay, machine infected. Now, to make it a little bit more easy for them, not that much for me, we also agreed that the machine would have to be infected with a very specific implant, a Metaprinter by Metasploit framework, one of the easiest implants to detect by memory forensics out there, okay? So my goal was not to hide one of my own developments and tools, that would be an advantage, but to hide something well-known and well-known to be easy to detect, okay? Obviously, we needed a uh, referee because, well, that's a challenge and we are all going to be cheating. Not the Finnish, but I'm Spanish, so I'm going to be cheating, okay? <laughs> yeah, let's be honest. So, that was the, uh, the guy. That was a well-known memory forensics analyst, expert also, one of the guys I, I was asking about in one of the previous slides, and he would be the one um, taking care of the, uh, of making sure that everything was in place, okay? And, well, that's the sentence he, he, told about me when I explained how I defeated this, okay? And obviously, as any other challenge, there must be rules, okay? Now, at some point, we the, the, the challenge took place, okay? And uh, at some point, we had to decide if I had been beaten or if he had been in, instead, okay? Well, obviously, we don't have time here to, to actually make the challenge happen, but let me explain something that I can show in the after talk. One thing what I was considering for the challenge, okay, for this guy to come into the stage, take control of the machine, and do a live memory forensics analysis of that machine, would be that, in the end, for the attendees, that would be a black screen with a terminal and a lot of commands and letters and text going up and down, and everybody would be, you know, like him, like falling asleep, right? So... Uh, that was, that was not, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have classes, but I kind of show you. <laughs> okay, so that, that was not a good idea. So I decided I needed a graphical user interface, something to make it more visual for the attendees. And there happened to be some, um, some, uh, user interfaces for volatility, recall, these memory forensic tools, but they are web-based and in the end it's just the same, but inside a web browser. So point was defeated, right? So what I did instead was to develop my own um, GUI, graphical user interface, with a twist. Let me show you this if I can manage, okay? This is the uh, live, one of the live demos of this. Okay. Sorry. Give me a second. Let me see. Can you hear me? Where are you? Here. Okay, this is a virtual machine. Okay. Ubuntu virtual machine because it stopped working, obviously, shortly before the presentation. Okay, so what I did is, instead of creating a graphical user interface, I decided to change the meaning of the G. 
instead of a graphical user interface, I created a game user interface. So I created something that I called Memsic Mansion. It's a reference to an old game that I like to play. Okay, so what I created is this. Let me press that. So this is the map of the game. Okay, that's where our player starts in here. Okay, the numbers are the locations for the hosts, the people in that uh, mansion here. Okay, and um, each, I mean, what you are seeing here is a visual representation of the memory layout of a Windows machine. Actually, the the user space, the kernel space is the basement, and it's like the hidden part of the game, right? You, in order to be able to go down to the kernel space, you have to find your way in. Okay, so each of these rooms, okay, that has a number, okay, it's hosting a guest of that uh, house. While in the one over here, we have the common area. So in here, you have dynamically created a different guest, one for each of the common processes of a normally running Windows machine, okay? There is a plugin for volatility that you execute that's gonna tell you the common processes that are always found by default in any running Windows machine. All, all those are gonna be there, while the non-common ones are all gonna be hosted in their own specific rooms, okay? And you're like kind of a detective moving around, okay? And you have to query the different uh, in, uh, guests on the party, okay? And try to figure out who steals something. So you have to find the your way, you, you have to find the, the guest, okay? Let me see, yeah. So you move here, okay? And I think this is the butler. This is gonna be the guy that is gonna be helping you, okay? And that's the one that is gonna be telling you um, where the guests are. You have this help, you have the map, you have a bunch of spells because, well, it's kind of a fantasy game, okay? And if you, I think it was, yeah, it was G for the guests, okay? Makes sense, right? So you can see that the regular guest, okay, the guest in the common room, are here are all normal Windows services plus B, uh, virtual box because that was a virtual box machine. And in here you have the non-common ones, okay? The ones that are always present. And you can use numbers to quickly jump between the different places of the game. Uh, so instead of watching somebody typing, you don't want to spend the whole hour watching somebody walking around in a game, right? Okay, so that was the game. That's uh, something I can show you after the talk, but we don't have time in here. And that's what we use to show the people how to perform a memory forensics in a more visual way, okay? And uh, a little bit more fun. Okay, that's the reason the other guy called me lunatic. Okay, so let me go back to the slides and we continue, okay? Just one second. We're actually quite good of time. Maybe I have time after the talk to, to show it around, okay? Let's see. Moment. Here, I do this and maybe this. Okay, right. So, um, in a normal presentation like this one, but taking two hours instead of one, would, at this moment, uh, the guy would have done the, the analysis of the platform and uh, we would have seen if he managed or not to find it. And in any case, now comes the, the code mode, like in a good game, right? Being Spanish, you cheat, you find the good mode, the code mode, sorry, and then you you see how it's it's working inside, right? I don't know if there is any Spanish guy here or he has dealt with uh, Spanish in before and he completely agrees with me. <laughs> Most probably the second, yeah. Okay, so um, uh, for your information, by the way, um, Tommy, he couldn't make it, health issues, to that challenge. Well, he says health issues. I said that he was scared. So instead of him, uh, the referee actually was performing the, the analysis for two weeks before the conference, okay? And live on the stage, I called him and asked him if he had managed to find the implant or not. The answer was uh, yes. And I told him, but you found both of them or just one? And he said, just one, and you didn't find it because I actually placed one normal interpreter. So you could see something here, but not the, the hidden one, okay? So, let's go to the goat mode, okay? Yep. So, when I was, after studying a little bit memory and memory forensics, I was trying to decide how to do that, okay? I kind of imposed myself a bunch of uh, requirements, okay? Whatever solution or approach I decided to follow had to require no deep operating system, whatever memory skills. Okay, whatever the solution would require no deep memory forensic skills, and whatever the solution had to be multi-platform because I don't work 
much if I can work less, okay? So if you do it, you do it well. Now, why of these requirements? Obviously, if I try to defeat that by uh, using deep memory or memory forensics skills, I would try to play this game in my opponent's terrain, his area of expertise. That's that's not going to work. Because, I mean, I've been studying that for, I don't know, six months by that time, and he had been six years, ten years, whatever. So he's always going to know more than me about memory and memory forensics, right? Not good. So, instead of that, um, I had to find a different way. So, what way? Do we avoid the presence detection? So, you compromise the machine, you do absolutely nothing to make anybody sus uh, suspicious that you are there, so nobody's going to be looking for you, and then you're hidden. Kind of makes sense. I have a problem that was a challenge in which I had to provide the, the, the virtual, the, the memory dump. So already the suspicious was there, right? So not really going to work, at least for the challenge. Avoid the acquisition. What does it mean? It means that most of the time, the analysis of the memory of a suspicious machine is not performed live. What you do is you connect something into that computer and you make a memory dump. You make, like taking a snapshot of the running memory in that moment and then you take it offline to your own analysis laptop and you do the analysis there, right? So maybe the approach would be to, uh, do something to prevent my implant from being copied if such a thing happens. Okay? It would be tricky because in the end I'm giving the memory dump for the challenge, right? So how can I prove that I, no, not really working? Another option would be to avoid the analyst detection. Right? So they, they, they have the implant, they have the memory dump, it is there, but somehow you manage to avoid them detecting you. That's where we come to the requirements. That would require, usually, memory or memory forensic skills to try to find some hidden property of the memory management of Windows and how volatility or whatever the tool is doing that. Tricky. Okay, so what options do we have? One option is you just minding your own business in memory, they detect you, trying to avoid detection, and, well, they detect you, bad luck. The other option is the same, but you kind of try to take some active measures to avoid the detection somehow, okay? But in the end, if they find you, you're done, right? Now, the third option would be to, um, well, if they detect you, okay, you are trying to be a little more aggressive in the way you pre try to, to prevent the, the detection, right? And that's true, okay, but at that moment, it doesn't matter if you can run, okay, because they already know you're here, right? So I came up with the fourth option, the one I like it. If they are going to find you, well, <laughs> you fight, <laughs> and you fight back, okay? That's what I call the offensive approach. Remember the title of the, of the talk, right? So offensive memory forensics. Now, let's say this is funny, this is okay, but how do you implement that? I mean, the idea is cool, right? You are bringing all that to your own area of expertise instead of their own, right? That's kind of smart. Yeah, but how do you apply that? Okay, let's see how a normal procedure of a memory analysis works, okay? Still good in time. Great. So, let's say that this uh, Tommy uh, receives the memory dump that we have here on the bottom, okay, of that Windows machine. And he may be using tools like Redline, Radare, Volatility, Recall, whatever, to analyze it, okay? So, what he does, okay, it's, ah, well, of course, obviously, sorry for that, the memory dump has this tiny interpreter there because we are not preventing the acquisition, okay? The interpreter is there, or whatever the implant. Okay, so first thing he does is, well, he triggers one of those tools and tells them, okay, hello, Volatility or uh, Redline get me whatever amount of information, a specific amount of information on that memory dump, okay? So in the case of volatility or recall, you're executing a plugin, each plugin is a specific action, and um, to request for something. Like for example, I have this anonymous uh, memory dump, tell me what platform it came from. Is that a Windows, is it a Linux, it's a OS X, whatever. So obviously, uh, the plugin is gonna go to volatility, that is gonna go to Python, and whatever the tool is gonna end up querying, reading, analyzing something from the memory dump, okay? Now, that information is going to go back to the tool that in turn is going to end up being presented to Tommy, okay? That's pretty much how it works, okay? Now, it's his job and expertise and skills to properly analyze the, the information that he receives and follow the rules and the clues and try to find um, whatever is on memory, okay? Now, what if on top of Meterpreter, okay, you add something else on that memory dump. 
not on the memory dump itself, right? But on the compromised machine, so it's going to end up in the memory dump, okay? And uh, that something else, when the tools are reading the memory, so are actually touching this memory dump, somehow, okay, manage to copy itself, okay, into the running space, okay, the virtual memory of those tools. And after that, okay, the only purpose of this something that we will see is just to make sure that whatever information goes back to Tommy is tainted. So we hide whatever we want to have hidden. Okay? I mean, that's the concept. Okay? That would be cool, right? So it's like a rootkit. Okay? You, you got it there and uh, you're just making sure that the information that you want is kept hidden from Tommy. If Tommy is not able, is not receiving that from the tools, there is no clues to follow. It's hard to find anything, right? Now, how do you find that? In the specific case of volatility, for example, okay, if you take a look at how volatility is made, you could see that it's volatility, some uh, common class to deal with a massive amount of plugins. So volatility is pretty much all about plugins. Okay, so what I did, I was looking for vulnerabilities here. Okay, so you have volatility, that is just a Python program. You have the plugin that you are actually executing, okay, that it's programmed in Python, so you are executing Python, that most commonly, 99% of the time, is using some Python modules, usually developed by some third parties. So volatility may be properly coded and audited. Python, for sure, is going to be properly audited by now, okay, three versions, all that, most probably is quite solid. But the third-party modules, the libraries, we all know what happens with that, right? There is something going on now with uh, Node.js that people is scared because, oh, nobody is really taking care for those third-party dependencies. Okay, so what I decided to do is let's look for some Python modules, not volatility plugins, but Python modules, okay, that get loaded or used by pretty much any execution of volatility. And then let's look for vulnerabilities there. Looks like the easiest path, okay, less resistance. So, how do we look for vulnerabilities? Do we do fuzzing? Okay, I'm mainly a researcher. I'm not looking for gazillion bugs here. So I usually don't do fuzzing, like large scale fuzzing. I usually do manual uh, vulnerability hunting. But in this case, uh, Spanish are cheaters, but we are also lazy. So what I did is I used a concept called human fuzzing. So this gentleman here, sharp mind, brilliant person, the author of Radare, an awesome tool, okay, has something, some characteristics. One of them is brilliant. It's an excellent developer, lots of knowledge in reversing and forensics. And he deeply, deeply in the root and the core, in the heart, hates Python. Okay? Like really, really badly. Okay? So there is one thing about that. Every time he is forced to use Python, somehow manages to crash it. Every single time, no matter if it's a, a hello world program, it's going to crash for him. And he is so deeply hating Python that he's going to share those crashes with all the Python lovers that he knows, like me. So how did I fast Python? I just went to the chats that I have with him and started to scroll up, looking for a crash that would be exploitable in a plugin that I had. And it worked. <laughs> so I had the vulnerability. Thanks, Pancake. Okay, so now we have the vulnerability. That's good. Okay, so now let's recap, okay, a little bit. So what we have is a Windows 10 memory dump with a interpreter and something that has my tiny face there um, that at some point is going to be moved or copy into a memory dump because somebody is suspecting that there is something wrong with the machine, right? And... At some point, volatility, in this case, we will expand later, okay, is going to be analyzing this memory dump, and by somehow using or abusing that vulnerability, we are going to manage to move this whatever into the running other space, the, the, the running process of Python, okay, and it's going to turn itself into, it's going to activate itself, and it's going to turn that into some kind of in-memory rootkit, okay? So in the end, the approach I decided to follow at concept level, is to weaponize a memory dump, okay? To use the memory dump to actually attack the analyst, okay? Obviously, this is all fancy, okay? But this is only, well, so how do you do that? Okay, 
Well, this we are talking now is Windows as a target virtual machine, right? And we have to use Meterpreter. So it's going to be Meterpreter for Windows. Okay, now we do know, or I can let you know now, that Meterpreter has this ability that once in memory, it's going to allow you to upload into the memory of whatever compromised machine a random DLL that you have coded to expand the capabilities. Okay, so what I decided to do is to code a DLL, okay, that is going to be uploaded into Meterpreter after any uh, compromise. Okay, now that DLL is going to be there, sitting, floating in memory, send mode, doing nothing, minding its own business, but it's going to have a trigger. Okay? And that trigger, when it uh, executes, is going to execute an exploit. Okay? That then is going to execute some code that is going to be a rootkit running in memory whose only purpose is going to be to hide the presence of Meterpreter from, uh, in this case, let's say, <coughs> volatility. Okay? Easy, busy as a concept idea. It's still easy. Okay? Now, Remember what I say about being lazy? If I do it once, I do it properly. Okay, the thing is, well, if I do that, I do it for Windows, for OS X, and for Linux. Why? Well, because I never knew in advance if when the moment of the challenge comes, Tommy is going to be using a OS X machine, a Windows machine, or a Linux machine to perform the analysis. So whatever exploit I code, okay, has to be able to run on all three platforms. So I have to create three DLLs. One that is going to trigger the exploit if the, uh, the analysis is happening on Windows, another one on OS X, another one on Linux. Wow, that's a lot of, of uh, DLLs. Because then, if you know a little bit about exploitation, you know that you have to take care of something about architecture. Is that going to be a 32? Is going to be a 64? Oof, it gets complicated. So what if, instead, what we do is we create one single DLL Okay, with one single trigger, because the vulnerability is going to be common, okay, with one single exploit that is going to be running or be able to work on all the platforms, and then it's going to execute the rootkit that is going to be working on all the platforms in every single architecture, okay? Not, six, not 16, okay? Okay, that's what I had to do with one final twist. Okay, I'm going to give that guy the virtual machine for two weeks. Is he going to be using volatility? Most probably. Is he going to be using only volatility? Most probably not. He's going to be using as many tools as he can use. So whatever the exploit I create, uh, it has to be one exploit for volatility, another one for recall, another one for relay, as many tools as I can think of. Now, the good news, it was extremely easy to find vulnerabilities on this forensics, memory forensic software, or forensic software in general. Okay? Why? As it happens, so often, even in 2018, almost 19 nowadays, for some reason, defensive security software, the software, the appliances that the people develop to protect something, they feel themselves immune to attacks. So they don't care about the security of their own platform. Okay, so it was easy to. Now, let's go a little bit technical, but not too much. Okay, this is not the goal of this uh, talk. So, the first thing to make it happen would be to detect the architecture. Okay, so once the exploit is triggered, you are able to execute a bunch of bytes here and there. The first thing is to detect if it is going to be running in a 32 bits or 64 bits architecture. Okay, for that, in internet, there is this tiny useful piece of information that with just two bytes, okay, um, you are going to be able to do that because for different architectures, it's going to just do slightly different things. So by setting to zero, the value of a single register in memory, okay, and then triggering these two bytes, okay, the only thing you have to do then is to check the value of this register, okay, and depending on the value, you're going to know immediately if it's 32 or 64. Good, half of it is done. Now, obviously, after that, what you need to do is to determine the operating system. Okay, then we have another slightly uh, useful trick, okay, and that's over there, okay. That tiny amount of uh, piece of code, okay, is going to behave here down there. It's going to behave differently depending on the operating system, okay? And um, that's going to allow you, okay, to know if it's a Linux in 32, if it's a Windows in 64, a Linux in 64, or if not, by default, continue the flow of the execution to Windows 32, okay? This is 
uh, a little bit the code uh, by using Radare, okay, that um, is going to show you that exactly the same bytes, the same code for different architectures is going to behave differently. Okay, and now one second, I still have a bunch, some time, some minutes, and we're almost done here. So let me switch screens again, one moment, okay? Just one second. Ooh, that's a terminal. Okay, so what I did is I just put um, in a tiny binary, okay, this very same code. So we are opening that with Radare. Oh, let me try to increase the size of the of the font. Moment. Let me see if I can do that here. Um, make text bigger and um, make text bigger. Okay, and one more time. Okay, now, so the first thing we're going to do after opening this with Radare, that it's like so much intimidating tool is tell them to analyze the binary. Ta -da, that's it. And now we're going to tell him to show it in a more friendly way. That's the graph view. Okay, it's not really that useful because it's a big graph, so we're going to be using the zoom out functionality. Sorry. Okay, there we are. Here it is. So we only have the basic blocks here, the diagram, the tree graph of the execution of the program. No need to see the, the actual code. It's the, the one I already saw on the slides, okay? And you just have here that it's a, an elimination process, okay? You first determine the architecture. Based on the architecture, you do another test. And by elimination, you go to one or another uh, operating system. And the only thing you have to do is to put the specific code, the rootkit itself, in each of these tiny boxes for each of the operating systems and architectures. Okay, that at high level view, simplified is how you can create a simple multi-architecture. I think I can do, yeah, that's even easier. Um, how can you can do a multi-architecture operating system exploit? Okay, now, unfortunately, things are not always so easy. Okay, so if I come here again and I do, the, let me uh, view a slideshow here. Yeah, so unfortunately, even though this is quite easy, there is something called real world, and in the real world, this doesn't really work anymore. Okay, there is this memory protection techniques here to anti-exploit technologies, okay? And uh, I'm afraid that's not gonna work like that. So, in order to make it work on the real world, and I actually needed that to work on a real platform, okay? Uh, one of the approaches that you have, and the one I decided to go for, is to use Rob gadgets, which is, um, well, I hope you know what is Rob, because I don't really think I have time to explain that now here, okay. So, I do have my abilities, I have my limitations, and I reach my limitations in here, okay. I was fighting with that problem for some time, and then at some time I decided I needed help, okay. And then this guy here... Um, it's one of mo the most fast and brilliant uh, reversers and exploiters I've known, but likes to be a little bit hidden, right? He's going to make a presentation hopefully soon. Uh, look for it. But then I just decided to ask him for help, and uh, he kind of sent me a, in five minutes a drawing of a concept in a kind of, a, you know, um, piece of paper that he just happened to have in, I don't know. And he came in just asking me a question. It's like, is the size of the vulnerable buffer different for each platform? I went, I check, I say yes, and say, okay, what if you do that? What he recommended me to do was the following. Okay, now, this thing in blue here is the size of the buffer that you have to fill up to trigger the exploit, okay? Basic memory corruption, okay? Now, the size is different, meaning that if you execute the exploit in OS X, okay, you have to make sure to have the address of the first execution part in here, while if it's in Windows, it's going to be there, and on Linux, it's going to be there. It's a little bit simplified, but they are different, okay? So what he told me is, okay, then why don't you just put different drop chains in different uh, locations of the file, different offsets, okay? And then uh, based on that knowledge, you can control the flow of the execution once we use these previous uh, tiny pieces of code, okay? So to make it a little bit more visual, okay? So you trigger the exploit, okay? It happens to be on OS X. So um, in OS X, you fill all that, and whenever the program is regaining the execution, it's going to read this address. So in this address, you just increase the, 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 the address, okay, of the execution to, uh, by a known offset where you already know that you have stored the, um, over there, 
the OSX route chain. And it's just going to jump there and execute the OSX specific rootkit. While if it's just a Linux, okay, it's going to do the same here. And if it's Windows, it's going to fall directly in the Windows route chain. You just need to arrange that. Okay, it requires a lot of work, okay, because the memory is not always so predictable, but the basic concept would be like that, okay? And finally, okay, almost on time, and what now? You manage to get that, okay? In real world, well, the post-exploitation would be quite straightforward. Uh, let's remember this was for a challenge, okay? So what I decided to do to make it a little bit more interesting is, obviously, what I'm going to be doing is to hide the presence of Meterpreter in that memory dump from the analyst, okay? But I'm going to include a counter, okay, in the execution of that with persistence, okay? So I can know how many times the memory is, uh, is being read, okay? And whenever the counter reaches some specific amount, then at that point we're going to just remove the implant, okay? So we are giving some chances to the analyst to actually be able to figure out what's going on in here, right? Obviously, there was an issue here, is after my talk, a bunch of people would have access to that very same a uh, memory dump, and they would know all that. And I don't want to, uh, you know, share my zero days and my exploits just for free. Okay, so what I did also is I included another check for date. So a couple of days before the presentation, or three days, okay, if uh, the execution happened again, then we would jump straight to the remove. Okay, because then we make sure that uh, the, after the presentation of the talk, they can't go back and steal all my data by doing more manual analysis. Well, obviously, on the real world, you would just straight jump into the remove and try to make sure that nobody is, is going to be um, uh, finding your, your stuff. Okay, so before we go to the last slide, what would be, okay, the conclusion here, for me at least, okay, what I just said, okay. When I prepare all that, I thought this is never going to work because based on my experience past long ago experience in the antivirus industry, whenever you are dealing with evidence or in the antivirus case with malware, potential malware, you are going to be executing the analysis in a sandbox environment, highly controlled environment, okay, where everything is monitored, everything is controlled. So they are going to detect that explo uh, exploitation. They are going to see what's going on. They are going to be finding me. What I realize is that, again, for some reason, these guys don't feel threatened, okay? So they are just running that on the normal machines with no normal security or special security measures. So you're actually just exploiting any other desktop environment, okay? There is no nothing. The, the only thing they have sometimes is just a snapshot of the, of the machine. So after that, or uh, sometimes they can just install it back and get it fresh, okay? But they have nothing to detect. So I'm afraid it worked. It is working as of today because um, none of the people I, I inform about those vulnerabilities were actually interested in that. So, and as far as I know, the memory forensics analysts out there, they are still not protecting or monitoring their own platforms. So, um, as, of, as a concept, this still works uh, nowadays, and that's how I managed to uh, defeat or win the challenge. Okay? And that would be it. So, if you have any questions... Thank you, Hugo, for your great talk on memory forensics. Uh, do we have any questions in the room? Yes, we have one. Hello, my hey. wife is watching me. I'm just saying hi because this is being streamed. Okay. So somewhere there is a camera. So hello, Ellie. What What did the guy say to you, the, the judge? What was his response to you, the judge for the contest? Um, you're a brilliant lunatic. <laughs> You are a brilliant lunatic. Yeah. You are. Actually, one of them was uh, the, the referee that in the end was the one doing the analysis. Uh, the one that was kind of defeated was mad at me a little bit because I was exploiting his machine and he didn't like it. And he was not on the stage to defend himself, but uh, himself, but yeah. Now we're friends again. I think, I think so. So, anybody else? If I have seen. Yeah, have you seen in real life examples the same kind of hiding in memory? Because from memory analysis I've done, I would have, I would not have found the malware. And I suppose many of the participants here would not have found it. Mm -hmm. the, the question is how many of our machines are ex exploited in the same way and we're not able to f detect? I wouldn't know. As you said, I'm not aware of any case, but that may mean that it's not being used or it's not being detected. So <laughs> this is security. That's our common day stuff, right? You don't know. 
So, uh, but I can tell you, I never use that on the wild. Okay, this is purely for research purposes, and that's it. So, I'm a, a good guy. Not a question here. <laughs> Not Spanish, a but a good guy. Actually, a comment and a question. Um, you should have ended the the, the last uh, slide with the that and having you know your your adversary on the ground or something bleeding. That should have been the cool closing what? slide. Um? I'm just saying that if for the video, you know, for the Street Fighter, mm -hmm. you should you should have had your adversary on the ground bleeding or something. <laughs> no, 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 no need for that. But but the question I have, um, so you mentioned a lot of the automation, like uh, the memory forensics automation to like radar and and volatility. What happened if someone just cracked it open in WinDBG and and just did it manually? Can you know, like really intricately walk and step the stacks and, and look through it. I mean, if you execute the volatility, you stop it with a debugger and then you go step by step, do a proper analysis of the right time, you're going to find it. Because I didn't prepare the, I mean, also anti-exploitation and anti-debugging techniques, that would be like, no, no, just too much. Okay. No, no. If they do that with a debugger, they would have done that with a debugger, it would be there, easy to, to find. And by the way, no, I don't have the virtual machine with this on my laptop. No need to steal it. If you're gonna use the game, it's okay, but no need to run away with it. There is no exploits here, no nothing, okay? Any more questions from the room? No, then I wanna thank you about this, about your story about this not so flawless victory. It was full of flaws. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, uh, in about eight minutes from now, we'll have, uh, the next speaker. And uh, I hope to see you there. He will be talking about a simple implementation of a hardware wallet, H-Wallet.